doing right now is team correlation. And I'm going to show you, I have to go over here, so what, what we do in pre-cal for team correlation. Okay. Oh, it's coming. Okay. I'm really bad about it. I'm not waiting. to get the reviews, to get the rubrics, to get everything they need to know for the chapter test and also for the projects. And so they would come here and they would look under team correlation project. We have places where they download their assignments. This is not me by myself, by the way. Ms. Wise and I both do this. Um, we have a place where they can download their assignments, their papers, <coughs> and their individual papers and their team papers, and they can get all the rubrics. So let me show you some of the rubrics for team correlation. This one is part of, wait, I'm, I'm sorry, hang on, there we go. All right, this is the big rubric, and it's worth 100 points, and I go through and I tell them exactly what I want. In one of the meetings earlier today, we we're talking about classroom management, and they were talking about the expectations of the class. So this is one of our expectations. And basically what I've learned, if you tell students what you want, they will do it or they will at least try to do it. But if you just say, hey, I want you to write me this paper, write a report, or do this project, and you don't give them any guidelines, they don't know where, where to go from there. So I make it very specific, and I tell them what they're going to do is they're going to go out and they're going to collect data points, and it can be on anything that they want to. But I told them to make it worth, you know, have some meaning behind it. And then they're going to come back and um, work with some technology. They're going to make a, a scatter diagram. They're going to calculate some regression models. They're going to make some choices and choose the best regression model. Then they're going to make some predictions off that regression model that they chose. And they're going to write a paper about it, and they're going to present it to the classroom. Now, one thing, when I first introduce that to them, they don't have a clue about collecting data points or anything. But I teach the pre-calculus students, and my pre-calculus students are either going to go to AP Calculus or they're going to go to AP Stat or possibly both. So what I do is I have Daryl come in and we schedule a time and he does this bear hunt with my students. So they get introduced to a little bit of st um, AP statistics. And what they do is he talks about how you collect data and how you can skew data. And so that, that gives them already a connection with their AP stat teacher, which I like. And so anyway, I tell them exactly what they're going to do. And then in the middle of this is a team paper. We actually have to write a lot of team papers. And then they're going to present. We usually present in the seminar room. And when they present, these are the things I'm looking for. And they don't get points if they don't look under creativity. You have to incorporate another discipline. So I'm teaching math. They have to incorporate either history or some science or um, even they do dramas and music in here. And then uh, they have to use their artistic abilities. So they have to go to the fine arts realm and they have to find something that they can use. And I'll give you some examples of the things that they use later. And then they have to use technology. And I don't put specifics in there because every time I turn around, and boy, I learned some today and that beat me up, there's a lot of technology out there that um, it changes. Every year, every six months, it'll change. Something new comes along. And they have some kind of time constraints, and then I put their duties, and they have an individual paper, and they post all of that to Moodle. So I wanted to show you the paper rubric. And this is what Jamie actually helped me with. No, it wasn't Jamie, I'm sorry. Chris and Jamie both work together. And I talked to them, and I, we were just doing this presentation. We just started last Thursday after our faculty meeting on Wednesday. And I loved it, but the timing was perfect because I got to talk to them about the lit exam, the junior lit exam. And in their paper, they have five different outline points. And each one of those is graded. I said, it's graded just like the lit exam. You've got two outline points for each of the five parts, and then you're getting a zero, one, two, three, or four. And we go through and we talk about what did each one of them, what it requires for each one of them to get the certain score. So I feel like I'm doing my part, doing your lit exam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The other project that my students do, they do this at the very beginning of the year, and this is the spaghetti project. 
And hopefully, some of you has raise your hand if you've had anyone uh, do this in your classroom. Love it, love it. Okay, what the Spaghetti Project does for me is it helps my students make the connection between the unit circle and the graph of the sine or cosine function. And they actually take spaghetti and they smash it and they break it off and they put it um, in a graph. It looks kind of ghetto and the hall looks ghetto. Daryl hates it down there because <laughs> they look pretty just I know my child. Anyway, then I have them go into your classrooms and thank you so much for letting them do this. And they have to, hopefully if they do a good job, they have to explain how you go from a unit circle to a graph of a sine function and a graph of a cosine function and go through the whole process. And I think that helps. I think it helps at the beginning of the year, particularly because it helps build those relationships with their new teachers, because they have to ask another teacher to let them come in their classroom. And uh, I think that helps build those relationships. And you know what? They've been into PE. They've been into um, the agri classes. And I know they go to the science classes a lot, and art as well. And maybe there's someone in there that just like will see a connection between circles and graphs when they're not doing math, then maybe that'll inspire them a little bit to go down that path. Um, some life skills that I think that they learn while doing these projects, um, they learn about technology. Now I'll tell you a little, about, a little bit about the technology, the way I handle it, because I can't keep up with it. It's beyond me a lot of times. But um, I tell them, you have to have 10 points of technology, and it has to work in the seminar room. I always had to put that stipulation in there, because a lot of times stuff doesn't work in the seminar room. But um, they use uh, Prezi's, and they'll use PowerPoints, and that's what my challenge is for them this time. I said, I want you to use Prezi's. I want you to try to make one. They're doing it in a group, and we kind of I give them some time in class. But most of my students, they'll go home, and they'll do a lot of it at home. And from what I heard with the Beam Me Up, they can actually work on it all at the same time, which will work really nicely. And um, then I told them also, I want to move, and I, I hope this doesn't offend some of the math teachers, but I want them to move past the T84 calculator. Because I tell them, on the job, you are going to have a situation where your boss is going to say, hey, compile this data, and we're going to make a prediction in the future. And that's what we do with the correlation project. I remember when Dr. Brackett and Dr. Shepard talked to us geometry teachers, this has been a couple of years ago, and they were saying, why do we have so many F's in geometry that we have people that are passing the geometry test? And I was very curious about that too. And so I actually took some data. This isn't just because I'm a math teacher. It could have been any other class, because if you're looking at the grade compared to their, their uh, grade in the class compared to their grade on the test. And so I compiled some data and did a little regression and, and looked at it. And one thing I found out is a lot of those students that were making Fs never made it to take the test, you know, which happens. They kind of fall out along the way. But that was something that's a life skill that they're probably going to have to do. They're going to probably have to interpret some data. And this will give them a chance to see a little bit about that. And then uh, if re they can retain their content. They, they'll remember that. I can say in calculus, hey, remember uh, we're talking about the sign graph, and they'll be, oh, I kind of remember that waves. And I'll say, well, think about the spaghetti project and how that relates. And they're, oh, yeah, I remember that. So they remember the spaghetti project. And then um, parental involvement. And I want to tell you a couple of things about parental involvement. One thing that I have my students do, another project, is um, interviews. I have them go out at the end of the year, and I have them find a person in real life that they know they can touch that they uh, use trig or calculus on their job. They actually use it. They don't teach it, but they actually use it. And of course, they leave the room thinking they're never going to find anybody. But I have to tell you about Grant Gershner. is hilarious. Um, his team was kind of struggling trying to find someone. And it got to the point where they finally found uh, an engineer. I can't remember where it was. Somewhere kind of locally. And um, the only way they could get to him to interview him was during the day. So we got special permission, all the parental notes filled out and everything. And I happened to see Janet in the nurse's office, and, and uh, she mentioned something about it. And she said, yeah, we had this discussion last night when Grant was asking me to sign this paper. And he said, she said, I can't believe he didn't know that his dad does trig every day. <laughs> <laughs> so they were trying to find someone that used trig or calculus. And, it would have been very easy. So there was another group that was struggling worse than they were trying to find some someone, so they actually interviewed Grant's dad. <laughs> but I love that whole idea how they get each other together. And then the other thing is um, 
you get classmates together that normally don't work together. They don't hang out together. They're not, they're not all on the basketball team. I have some creative things. I just threw some up here that one of my students did, or a group. They um, made a comic strip as part of their artistic ability. And they spent hours, not hours, okay, maybe a couple hours, uh, working on this. And they were talking about, talking about the project, but they are also talking about each other. They were also talking about, my parents said this, and I can do, I mean, they were talking. And the, the people that, the girls that were involved in this, there was one athlete, one girl that just didn't match up anywhere, and one really smart girl that, you know, kind of had a different, um, you know, she was all involved in academics and making the game. But you get kids together that are doing things together that they don't normally do. And then the other thing I wanted to show you was, anybody have, uh, Matt, uh, sorry, uh, hang on one second, uh, Mason Thomason. Uh, he's a senior, okay? I don't know if you know it in your classroom, but he has a trouble, and he has trouble in my classroom with time management. And he kind of, he knows how to do stuff. He's really good. But he doesn't always do assignments that he doesn't feel he needs to spend his time on. And so <laughs> we did the conics project, and that's where they have to do all the conics sections. And they have a drawing, and they have to, you know, you have to make a picture of it. And then they have to make their calculator make that graph. And it's pretty hard. There's a lot of... Uh, content that, that goes along with doing that. A lot of math in the background. And so Mason, I knew he was working on it, but he just never wanted to complete the task. And so his grade, uh, uh, went ahead and gave him his grade, he had a zero, he didn't turn anything in. And so he came, he actually texted me, I think, and he was saying, Miss Wade, please let me turn this in. I, get, I have a policy for turning stuff in late. And I said, okay, you can turn it in late, but it better be amazing. So the next day, he said he, him, his mom, and dad all worked on it all night decorating and stuff. And the next day, I had this on my desk. It has Christmas lights, and it was plugged in, and it was all flashing. And I was like, <laughs> that impressed me. That was good. <laughs> um, but they get to know each other, and then they get to make connections with professionals. I had um, Ty Watley. Do you guys, anybody have him? It's been a couple of years. He was really into, at one time, he was talking about going into the Air Force. He was really involved in airplanes and avionics and all that. And during the interview where they have to go and find someone to interview, he actually went to an engineering firm that made the, I don't know the name, but they made this little thing inside the airplane where it would make a video of how the, or make a, a like a diagram, a screen, how the plane was moving, like a, a I don't know, a simulator sort of thing. And so he went and, and talked to, the group went and talked to this man and asked him all kinds of questions. And then I think Ty stuck around a little bit. He was really interested in that. And then they get like five extra points if they bring the person in the classroom during class and you can touch them and poke them and they're alive. And so, so he brought this guy in and um, him and Ty just really hit it off. And that guy offered Ty a summer job and also an internship. So I don't know if he ever took it or not, but it was he, right in front of me. He got that. So it's making some connections to the future. And so I just think that, that those are some really good things that help. I have to admit today, I came in today, this, you know, it's holiday, my family's at home, I don't want to be here. I think this was one of the best days that I've spent in in service. God, I've learned more about what I can take from today and incorporate into my classroom than from any anything I've been to before. So thank you guys, that was awesome. Um, yes, when I put my name on the list too for project based learning, um, I decided I would do what I think we're all supposed to do and bring your perspective um, to the topic at hand. And for me, I was going to bring a science perspective. Do you know, in listening to everybody today, I'm more convinced now than ever that we all have the same basic desire for our students. And that's really to have them fearlessly use technology to understand, why do I have to know this? And, and make it memorable and make it relevant. And so it was interesting as I was listening to everybody today, I was um, thinking about that. And when we, um, yeah, right? When we, um, when we talk about project-based learning, a lot of times it seems to be huge, that it can take a semester or it can even be a year-long project. And we don't think about it as just days. And so 
I started thinking, does it really matter? Well, in science, we get to do project-based learning all the time, whether it's physical, chemical, life science, and we call those experiments. And for us in science, many times we have to have a smaller chunk of time. We can't afford to have a, a project that's going to last for weeks because in science, we have to do it again and again and again. It must be repeated. We base most of what we do on repeated trials. So even if it comes out right, do it again. Was it by accident? Especially if it comes out wrong, we need to do it again. Where did it go wrong? And sometimes these kids, and I don't know about you guys, but these kids come into the classroom wanting to know exactly what it's supposed to look like when it's done. But that doesn't really allow them to investigate and explore. What's a plant supposed to look like when it gets this kind of light? What's a cell supposed to look like if it gets this hormone? What's an animal supposed to act like when they're exposed to this? We don't know, right? That's the whole purpose. They have to get lost before they can really have explored anything. And I like this quote. Um, oh, okay. Did I go? Yeah. Wrong way? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just, uh, <laughs> go, go back to uh, go back to do it again. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Um, there was a there's a there was a quote that I had there that said um, sometimes the most exhilarating phrase in science is not no is not <laughs> is not Eureka I found it but it's hmm that's funny. So sometimes the failures are really where we find um, our greatest successes. Penicillin was discovered because of this mold that was living next to this dish of bacteria. Oh, that inhibited bacterial growth. Very good. So um, failures are necessary in science. And, and, and being me up, we talked about don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to fail. Failure is necessary. You have to know that it's not going to be the end of what you do. So go ahead. Come on. Yeah. Um, go back to so what. Okay, so what? When we, uh, when we teach these kids to do these experiments and science, and I think all of your projects, you teach them, so what? So what? Why does it matter? So they have to be able to apply it to the real world. Why do we care if these cells don't grow? Why do we care if we can um, culture our bacteria um, from the drinking fountain and grow it in the incubator? Why do we care that we can look at DNA from various people why do we care that some people are immune to HIV? Why do we care? Why does it matter? What are those applications? And so I think it's, it's really important, especially in science, to have them be able to give you a real world application. And, and that's exactly what happens with um, project-based learning. And, okay, who cares? Who cares? This is an interesting part of project-based learning in the Buck Institute, um, Educational Institute. And that's where this is all housed, is that they wanted, they believe that public presentation is very important. But I think sometimes we have to look at our uh, proper audience or an appropriate audience. So we look at people who can understand our content, what we're speaking, and not only that, but we take it to people who are true experts, people who have the ability to critique you, to look at your work and say, is this good? Scientists are the best at eviscerating each other. And that's important because we need to have people who will um, put the bright light on discovery. I'm a firm believer that much of what we see and hear in our media, especially with regards to health and science, is not true, is BS. And I want my students to be able to <coughs> listen to a report, to read an article, and to know if this data is valid. To know, is this experiment well done? Did it have controls? Or is this company just trying to scare me to not drink orange juice or to not get a vaccination? You know, let's look at the historical, the social, the mathematical, scientific perspectives of what's being thrown out at us. So I think, um, no, go back to the, now this is the quote. So we look at who is an expert. <coughs> Niels Bohr is a Nobel Prize winning quantum and astrophysicist, laid the fundamentals for most um, of what we know in physical science today. And his definition, I think, is a pretty wonderful one. He's an expert, is a man who has made all the mistakes which can be made in a very narrow field. So don't be afraid to make those mistakes because you can become an expert. Thank you. I tell my kids it's the 
know, so when you get in front of big groups, you remember, you know, imagine everybody in their underwear, makes you, you know, less <laughs> nervous. I grew up with a dad, eighth grade education in a trailer park out in the country, and he had a little different take. He sat around in his underwear, imagining large groups of people with their clothes on. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably explains why I'm a little different. <laughs> uh, when we're doing this is having kids connect to the future and everything, and I bounced around about how I wanted to do this, but I think one thing that's really important, this is my 24th year, so I'm starting to get on the other end of that process now. And everyone, I think it probably applies to most of you, and I'll start looking back, and we're all links in a chain. And you think about your teachers. And I think about my, that's why I'm teaching, because of those teachers. And I don't want to let them down. They're important to me. You know, and you go back, and you look now where you're at, and we're that link for a lot of our kids. And, but there's a future. And the other thing about that chain that really worries me at this time is how fragile that link is. Because I've been teaching 24 years, and these kids are an important link, but they're real fragile. And we need to get them where they really connect to what's going on. And my frustration last few years, I almost felt like, if I can't get right here, I can't really get to them. The, the technology, the texting, everything else we have, you've got to almost really get right in there and make meaning to them, or it doesn't work. I've come from being Mr. Nofturf to Noth. And I battled that, and as I'm Mr. Nofturf. Then I started realizing the link in the chain, these kids don't mean anything bad by that. That's who they are, and they're different than when I started. And I'm having to adapt probably more in my teaching career the last few years than ever before because it's a generational shift that's taking place with this link. And so to me, I teach with kind of an emergency, and I let them know this, the emotion that you're going to be paying for my uh, retirement. And you've got to be sharp. <laughs> and so with that in mind, I every day... Talk about things that are right now. History is important. I want to make those connections and linkage. Uh, but you, you know, you got to bring in things. Uh, let's see. We have up there vigilance and finding articles. I'm constantly reading the papers, and I think every one of you in your area need to be looking for what's out there. It's relevant for the kids to bring it in every day and discuss with them what's relevant in your field to them to make that linkage. Uh, try to read books that uh, to create uh, ownership. Of, and one thing I think kids are really lacking, it, it puzzles me, is curiosity sometimes. And, and that's the part that, that really I don't, I, I don't get. I get a lot of the rest that's been around or since I've been teaching. But the curiosity that they need, again, I think they have to get outside themselves again to really to, to get that. And that's a frustration to try to do that. Diversity and linkage, I heard it quite often today when I went to the other... Uh, sites and listen. A lot of us, the same thing is they get it, but can they link it to anything else and really go further? And that's where the wheels come off. We're seeing that. And that is a key point that as we go forward. Uh, I like to create platforms of thought. And I'll talk about that as I finish up on this. Is with the next thing on that is paradox of social development. That actually comes from this book, Ian Morris. Why the West rules for now, the patterns of history, and what they reveal about the future. I like to scare my kids to death every chance I get. The Chinese are coming. Okay? They're under the bed. They're in your closet. I had them the other day. He said, look at your clothes and your backpacks and stuff. And you know what they found out? The Chinese are outsourcing to Pakistan and Jordan. Now, that's thought-provoking when you start to go to that point. And they need to wear the, their Their competition is a global and the world's changed, and that's a global perspective that we need to bring to these students every day. Uh, so with this, and this is one I use in my AP World class every day to establish what we start talking about. The price of growing complexity is growing fragility. That's our kids. We are becoming more complex, but there's a fragility in that, and social development creates the very focus that undermines it. And well, further, well, this is not mine, this is Ian, Ian Morris in his book, is backward folks can take you out. Because we've become so complex, and other folks, and, and so that's where we're at. We've got to get these kids, that they're linking that chain. They're very complex, but they're very fragile. And I mean, I see it, I mean, it, more than ever. And so those are the kind of things that I like to talk to them about uh, every day. And I, so I like to take the bull by the tail and face the situation. <laughs> Uh, one of those is in the paper Sunday. Unfilled jobs require skills, 67% of manufacturing. And I get to them how old my Chinese are taking over. They're going to, but yet, when you find out manufacturing in the United States continues to grow, providing good paying jobs, 
or the world's largest manufacturing economy, producing 21% of the world's global products. China is way back there. But when you read the next section, manufacturing produces 11% of our annual gross domestic product. That's not good. Historically, the Dutch, the British before us, when they get the 10% of production in that area, we went to the easy stuff, financials, derivatives, banking, high risk, high return, go back to the Dutch, go to the British. That is an economy and a society in decline. They need to know that. And it's right there in the paper. But you've got to look at statistics and read them to understand. Uh, the paper again yesterday, skyscraper boom, harbingers of doom, and LSS. And who's building all the skyscrapers right now? China and India. And they're going into a big bubble. And we've already been there. Japan's been 20 some years trying to get out of that bubble burst. They need to know this because they're in this competitive global world. As fragile as they are, we need to talk to them like adults every day and remind them that they have responsibilities. Uh, the last one I think is kind of fascinating is uh, Generation Cell. And it's looking at the different generations and dealing with our latest generation. Some are calling it the lost generation. Uh, but, so we need to have discussions on that and put it in the context of literature, science, math, and history. And do it daily with them. So keep them focused on what's important out there because they are going to pay my retirement. Uh, last thing, there's one more, I think, just in one use. Uh, in all this, when monarchs cut costs, they alienated the civil servants and soldiers. When they squeezed more, all the taxpayers that alienated their merchants and farmers. Violent protests by the poor intensified as dispossessed gentry, bankrupt, and you see unpaid troops and failed officials joined in. And I let them read this and they reflect. And to me, it's like, this is, you know, you learn from history. My gosh, listen to our politicians, left, right, center, what are they saying we have to do? And I try to explain to my kids, 21st century, are all isms dead? We're done? You guys don't have to create anything anymore. It's already been done. There's new challenges, and it's yours. And I firmly believe that this next generation is an important leap in that chain, and we're going to have to really. And I think the, if you t talk to them like this, they respond well to it because they understand that. Now, some of them don't like to as much, but you, you, know, you need to bring that relevance to them every chance you get. And so th I guess that's just my thing is try to make sure, looking not down at it, but looking to the future. The last thing I always talk about is also from this book, Renaissance or Enlightenment. Fascinating. You can, tell you, also, you can read a whole book and get one thing from it, and it's worth it. Renaissance versus Enlightenment. Are we in a Renaissance or are we in Enlightenment? I said, our generation of Renaissance, we're going to look to the past and say, here's how you go forward. Listen to the politicians. You're an enlightenment. This group we have now have to be the enlightenment. And it's scary because it's reform, and reform has changed, and it's never been gone down well in history. But this generation has to be it. So that's kind of, I think, you, you know, let them know what's going on. Okay, so I have the uh, unenviable position of being the last presenter of the day. Um, <laughs> I will reassure you, though, I'm only going to talk about two projects, two year-long projects that we've done in the senior class. The good thing is, is that if you have ever had a senior in your class, you're probably already familiar with these projects, so I don't have to say that much. Um, you know, I teach English, so essentially we have reading and we have writing. and. You know, district, rigor, relationship, relevance. The question that the 12th grade uh, team tried to answer was, how do we make what we read and the writing that we do relevant to the students? Well, for the, um, for the writing, I'll start with that. The days of our lives. There's no, more, there's no group that is more um, self-focused or self-centered than teenagers. So we decided, okay, let's use that. And we developed our memory book project. You know, we have to teach different types of writing, expository writing, descriptive writing, narration. And we decided the way to do that is to have the students write about themselves. And writing's an ongoing project, so we, um, we developed our memory book slash writing portfolio. And 
throughout the year, uh, roughly um, once a month, the students have papers that they do. And all of the writing is personal. So they, uh, they have a range of options from which they can choose the topics. They can write on a place that is not necessarily home, but a place that makes them feel at home. So they have to identify what are the uh, qualities of home, and then why, and then in their paper. So they define, and then they explain why is this place like home, and so forth. So throughout the year, there are um, research chapters. Um, it's changed over the, over the years. Um, some years we have them um, research and plan their ten year high school reunion. So part of, part of the project, it requires them to look back, reflect upon their life, um, think about where they are now and where they will be. Uh, because if you, um, actually if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, this quotation, it is our choices that show what we truly are, far more than our abilities. This is on a banner uh, hanging in the front of my room. Uh, can anyone impress me and tell me from where this comes? Who said it? No, uh, this is uh, this is Professor Dumbledore to Harry, <laughs> explaining that you may have a connection with Voldemort, and you and there are things that have happened to you in your life, but it is the choices that you make that define your future, and so that's what we try to get to, in part through our writing project. So look at your past, what has happened to you, where are you now, and where do you want to be? What life do you want, what kind of person do you want to be? And so that's one project that goes all through the year. Second project is the Star Wars project. And it ties into both the literature and this idea of choices. Um, the Star Wars project um, or the Star Wars Super Epic Hero Project came out of, um, originally was inspired by some, some university programs. <coughs> Once again, we were looking at a way to get the students engaged with the literature. And, uh, and much of what we read is, in some way or another, um, hero literature. Uh, we start the year with Beowulf. Uh, we read Macbeth. Um, so what we did is, um, building on the work of Joseph Campbell, an American mythologist, um, who came up with the idea of the monomyth. He studied uh, myths and legends from all around the world and across time and discovered that there are distinct commonalities. And if, um, if you're, those of you who are familiar with um, Star Wars and George Lucas know, you know that when he was in college, George Lucas studied the work of Joseph Campbell. And it was very much in the forefront of his mind when he developed these films. So what we do uh, with the Star Wars is we, we introduce Joseph Campbell. We look at his hero's quest outline. We talk about what are the stages of the hero's journey. And of course, it's all based on decisions. An average person who makes the decision to set out on a course that eventually leads to that everyday average person becoming a hero. Choices. In the literature that we read, then, we look at the actions of the characters. And through our viewing of the Star Wars films, we look at Joseph Campbell's work. And here we have, actually, two hero's journeys. Episodes 1, 2, and 3, we have what seems to be an abortive hero's journey, a hero who becomes adult. Episodes 4, 5, and 6, we see the complete Joseph Campbell outline. But then when we look at it, we find, actually, that the original hero, Anakin, does fulfill that journey. 
So as we read the films, we're, we're, we are discussing them and approaching them as though they were literature, and then tying the films because it takes the whole year to watch them. We then tie them, comparing and contrasting characters and decisions. And then at the end of the year, they are responsible for creating their own original super epic hero. Super epic hero because we talk about uh, comic book heroes. Those of you who know me, you know, or have ever seen my room, uh, that will not come as a surprise. And so we tie in these elements, and then the student is responsible, as I said, then, for creating and writing an original super epic hero uh, story. So then, once again, bringing it back to tying in uh, sort of our theme of choices, incorporating the literature that we've read, the films that we've viewed, and, of course, another major writing project. And so those are, those are two things um, that we do as they run throughout the year in um, senior English. And as a couple of people have said, you know, when I was first asked to be on this uh, panel, I couldn't, I honestly could not think, well, what do I do that is project-based project learning? Because these came out of, well, I think for me, this is what I see as the right way of approaching it. We looked at our material, we looked at our students, and then figured out what can we do that will help them reach the goals that we have identified as being important. Bless you. Rather than saying, oh, here's a list of five strategies. How can I create something to match the strategy? We created what we thought would be edu educational, rigorous, relevant work for them. And it happened then, oh, there's a label, there's some jargon that applies to this work. So if you think, oh, what can I do? Start with what you have. Start with the work, start with your material, think about your students, and let it come out of that.